say you see me Our first contestant, Steve, uh, Leonard Stein. A little bit of great. <clears throat> A little bit of great, Leonard Stein. Part of the great country of Oklahoma, the last rains came gently and did not cut the scarred earth. Call me Ishmael. I am invisible. These are each the first sentence of three classic American novels, written by John Steinbeck, Herman Melville, and Ralph Ellison, respectively. Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests, in my heart of hearts, I too wanted to be a writer who would write that great American novel. I wanted to write something that would emotionally mesmerize millions of people. Something that would be on the New York Times bestseller list. Something that would be studied in schools and universities for decades. I'd even settle for something that was a summer blockbuster with two sequels in the works. <laughs> and to that end, oh, I'd take writing classes. And I'd come home with enticement and intrigue flowing through my fingertips. And I'd fervently type up my ideas turning some into short stories, or listen to chapters of potential novels that went nowhere. But I'd keep trying, 
For practice, I'd write comedy skits, some of which were used in stage productions, as well as little song parodies, poems, and lyrics for friends and family on special occasions, such as birthdays, graduations, and retirements. Those writings contain both humorous personal anecdotes, combined with a strong emotional message at the end. <clears throat> this past summer, my wife Laurel's younger relative, Krista, came into town from Tucson, Arizona, with her husband, Matt, and their adorable little four-month-old baby, Jacob. And they stayed with us in Chicago for about three days. And during one of those nights, we had a little party for them. And everything was going really well. But at one point, Krista hands little Jacob off to Matt, and she goes downstairs, OK? But about 20 minutes passes, and she doesn't come back up, and we're all upstairs. So I'm thinking, maybe something's wrong. So I go downstairs. And sure enough, I see her sitting on the couch with her head in her hands. I say, what's wrong? And she says, I'm exhausted. This motherhood is overwhelming. And I'm wondering if I'm doing it right. Well, I wanted to console her, but I'm not a parent. So I couldn't empathize with her, nor am I a licensed psychologist to dispense professional information if needed. But I do know one thing, that in any relationship, if you focus on the positives, It'll help you get you over the hump of that which is negative. So I say to her, tell me some things you enjoy doing with little Jacob. She says, well, back in Arizona, on Tuesday mornings, we go to the library. They have storytelling time, where someone reads his little nursery rhymes and fairy tales to newborns, young children, and their moms. OK, keep going. Well, she tells me the previous week, prior to coming to Chicago, she was in Lena, Illinois. And that's where she's from. And she stayed at her mom's house on Grove Street which is where she grew up. And she had a chance to see her cousins there whom she hadn't seen in years. And they all had a chance to hold little Jacob. And when it came time for his nap, she put him in his crib. Then they went and they played cards on the dining room table, gin rummy, just like they would used to do when they were kids, brought back memories. Keep going. OK. Well, the next day, they went to a parade in Lena, her and Matt and child. And what Lena had is this early fall parade where they have classic cars, marching bands, and floats. This is something she used to do with her dad when she was a kid. However, her dad had recently passed. So as we talked further about this, she felt really proud to be able to bring her husband and her child to carry on this tradition. And as our conversation continued, talking about friends and family, a lot of the stress just started to melt away. Then this crazy idea came to me. I told her, I'm going to write you something completely silly and funny about some of the things we just talked about that you could sing to your baby when you're playing with him or putting him to sleep. Really? You can do that? I can. I am a writer. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So we went back upstairs. And a few days after they left, I sat down and thought about some of these ideas. Here's what I came up with. One library morning it was storytelling time. But the tots grew tired of Dr. Seuss and Mother Goose our nursery rhymes. So the reader said, well, I'll tell you something you'll all want to hear. It's the legend of little baby Jacob, so let me in here. While his mama played cards with her cousin's clan, little baby Jacob was devising the plan. You see, he hopped out of his crib. He left a note heading down to the Lena Tom's crib as a joke. <laughs> as he crawled down Grove, he thought he had it made until he came upon Lena's early fall parade. Now, bands of purple step came marching by. He wanted to be the Grand Marshal guy. He was amazed at what he next saw. Classic Dodges, Fords, Chevys, Varoom. He was in awe. But just then, the band leader dropped a baton. <laughs> it rolled to baby Jacob. Crowd shouted, hey, talk get it on. But he wasn't scared. He didn't cry. Why, laughing and smiling, he gave it a try. Now the crowd was amazed. All those moms, those dads, those boys and girls said that Todd, he can't walk, he can't talk, but he sure can twirl. <laughs> <laughs> and when his parents finally did find him, he had all the floats following right behind him. The mayor then spoke. <clears throat> Taking a vote, we are all partial to have little baby Jacob be our next grand marshal. Just Give him lots of love from his head to his toes. So he grows and grows, and then he grows and grows. Now I emailed it away. I even made up a video to go with that. 
<laughs> About three days later, I get a response from Crystal Lynn. I don't know how you did that, but that was awesome. Matt and I laughed so hard. We needed that. Thank you. We love you. Keep on writing. I will keep on writing, but I tweak my perspective just a little bit. Maybe something doesn't have to reach a million people or be on a bestseller list or be a summer blockbuster with however many sequels in the works to be great. Maybe we just need to use whatever innate talent we have or don't have, or more basic than that, just show that we care to help just one person by giving him or her encouragement, laughter, and hope. And maybe we have done something great. To the red country and part of the great country of Oklahoma, the last rains came gently and did not cut the scarred earth. Call me Ishmael. I am invisible. And one library morning it was storytelling time. <laughs> Mr. Tulsman. <laughs> Contestant number two, Pramod Singh. Searching my spark. Searching my spark, Pramod Singh. said to me, whichever stage you are on, set the stage on the fire. And that's what I was trying to do here. <laughs> but see, I failed to spark my ignition. All my life, I wanted to be the part of something big, big like this. Not too long ago, when my dad asked me about my career ambition, I said, I want to get a decent job and settle down. He showed to me a guy right across the street, said, son, look at that man. He is a rickshaw puller, but you know, his son has a bigger dream, much bigger than yours. He wants to join Indian Administrative Service. For those of you who do not know, Indian Administrative Service test is one of the world's toughest tests and the notorious one. You require intense labor and preparation. Every year, around 20 million most competent and talented people appear for the test just for 200 seats. I think that even God would think twice before appearing for the test. <laughs> and think about this guy, who did not even have the basic facilities at his home, like electricity and work, and he's dreaming to be an IAS officer. Look at me. I got all the luxury in the world. My father has spent a lot of money on my tuition and coaching. I got all the latest books, journals, materials, free access to library, 24 by 7 power, servants, air-conditioned rooms. But still, I was so hesitant to take the test. By the way, air-conditioned room in India is a luxury. <laughs> on the other side, this guy at his 
home, he did not even have a study table. All he had was a oil lamp and few books, but he had no complaints. I would see him studying days and nights tirelessly. It was a rare sight of extreme penury and a fierce determination. He would always be so positive and a fire and spark within that he is trying to do something big. He used to come over to borrow books from me. Most of my books were brand new, not even opened once. <laughs> the print of the smell was still so fresh as if they had just arrived from the bookstore. <laughs> One day, it was peak summer. Temperature outside was about 50 degrees centigrade, hot like boiler. I was passing by and saw this guy through the window. He had covered himself completely in a blanket. I thought he must be sick. That night he came over to return my books. <coughs> I asked him, hey, what happened to you? I saw you had wrapped yourself in a blanket that too in extremely, extremely hot weather. Were you all right? He said, yeah, I was all right. Because of the heat, I was not able to concentrate on my studies. So I decided to wrap myself completely in a blanket. I wanted to test myself how much heat I can survive before I break down. And today, I beat the heat. <laughs> now, this heat doesn't bother me. I thought this guy has gone completely mad. <laughs> it was insanity, right? But no friends. On that day, I saw hunger in his body and fire in his eyes. A fire that was burning brighter and longer than the one before. It was a small incident, but a true indicator that he was on the right track for whatever he was trying to achieve in his dream. It was his spark within that kept him awake in those odd moments with excitement and provided the strength to reach to the highest level of mental destination. He had dreamed, passionate about his dreams and was willing to die for it. For me, this exam was my life's biggest challenge. It was like crossing the mountain in bare feet. To what appeared to me like a mountain this guy, with his fierce determination and faith, turned him to that mountain. He, in fact, erased this mountain. He did not just qualify for the test. He taught the exam that too with the highest margin ever. Friends, we all have fire within us. We all feel the stir inside, tickling us and compelling us to take the next step. We feel the energy and the vibration. But if you miss the spark, the fire goes off. And that is heartbreaking. <coughs> my fire has gone off. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find my spark right here. My spark to believe in me that I can do this my spark to remove all the doubts whether I could do, whether I should be, whether I would be. My spark to conquer my fear that I'll fail today. So before you all go home, think about your fire. You think if your fire has gone missing, search for your spark. Strike it with your full strength and don't worry if you bleed. It stays there to tell you that you are on the right track for whatever you are trying to achieve. Strike it harder and harder, again and again, until you get the fire. Thank you. <laughs> May I now have a minute of silence, please.
Contestant number three, Eric Feinendagen. A gift from Grammy. A gift from Grammy, Eric Feinendagen. Without exception, we all share special moments in our lives. It could be that first kiss, the birth of a child, or that one special birthday. For some, that birthday sweet 16. Others, the day that we can drink, <laughs> legally of course. <clears throat> and yet for others, it's any birthday that ends in a zero. Meaning we survived yet another decade. But how many of us can remember a birthday that ends in two zeros? For my wife's grandmother, better known as Grammy, she can, for last spring she turned 100. Master Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, please allow me to repeat myself. She turned 100! That's triple digits. That's 25 leap years. That's like reaching 100,000 miles on the odometer of life. Hey, she's even 10 years older than Toastmasters. <laughs>
been said, that the greatest nation in the world is imagination. I gotta tell you, when I looked down at Mike's casket, it became plain, painfully clear to me that the worst nation in the world is procrastination. As he stepped down off that altar and embraced his grieving mother, I couldn't help but think. I always knew I'd see Mike again one day. I just never dreamed it was going to be that day. Our future is today. Sometimes we can look at life as a can. A can that we just keep kicking down that road. Someday, I'm going to write that book. Someday, I'm going to give that next speech. Someday, Natasha, I'm going to join up, up with people. <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> someday, someday, someday. Until eventually, we were not a Sundays, and we're left with no more days. Our future is today. This past Valentine's, my family and I, we went back to the nursing home to visit Grammy. And she was partying like it was 1969. <laughs> <laughs> because Grammy had taken first place. It was named Queen of the St. Valentine's Day Ball. <laughs> As I handed her my one-year-old, he gave her a big, great grandbaby hug. And a smile erupted on both of their faces. And it took me back to Grammy's birthday and the gift that she gave me that whether you're one or 100, or somewhere in between, don't wait until it's too late to live, to learn, and to love. Because our future is today. Contestant number four, Victoria McConville. Stand up. Stand up, Victoria McConville.
to set it on fire. And it wasn't the sight of my mother burning this videotape that caught me. It was my mother's face. I couldn't believe what I saw. My mother looked like she had just gone 10 rounds with a professional boxer. Her lip was split and swollen. Her eye was looking a little purple. She had bruises everywhere. Now my father, he's the gentlest man you'll ever meet. Unfortunately, or fortunately, he is a Vietnam veteran. So that movie triggered his post-traumatic stress syndrome. My father, that night, he was back in Vietnam. He was back doing whatever it was that was necessary to do his job. He was fighting a war in his sleep. He did not know what he had done to my mother. He did not know. And believe me, he was sorry when he saw it. And as it turned out, my mother ended up sleeping on a couch for two months after that. And as I grew up, and this film was created in 1986, and I watched my father deal with all kinds of injuries, illnesses, and his PTSD. He took us to several American Legion meetings, Veterans of Foreign Wars meetings, and then his many appointments at the Veterans Administration hospitals. It was in these visits to the hospitals where I met several veterans that I realized what a true hero really looks like. They're not the ones on the Saturday morning cartoons. These men and women, they stood up and said, I will support and defend the Constitution against <coughs> all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. They also followed the orders of the men and women appointed above them. And it was my father, even though I saw all these, it was my father who inspired me to make my own choices. So when I turned, six, turned 18, I made the decision to join the United States Air Force. I, made, I took that same oath that my father took when he was 18. I swore that I would protect and defend the Constitution. So all of the rights and the freedoms that we enjoy, I stood with my fellow men and women of the military and said, we will support and defend. And unlike my father though, I made a slight change. I joined the Air Force. <laughs> I wasn't going into combat like my father. I made sure I was guaranteed administrative. <laughs> I got this job. What I didn't realize, though, is that when you join the military, it changes you. You are never the same person that you were when you left. You are never the same scared 18-year-old child raising your right hand and swearing that oath. But we do it anyways. I was proud to serve my country. And I was proud of the veterans that I met on my many visits to the VA hospital. And it is for them that I stand up for now. I met several men and women there. A couple of them impacted me quite a bit. I met a man who had stepped on a landmine and doesn't have his legs anymore. He can't walk. <clears throat> and when I think about that man, I think about how is he going to walk his daughter down the aisle? How is he going to run a marathon? How can he do the things that we do on a regular basis? There was another man that I met 
that didn't have any arms. And I thought about, how does he feed himself? How does he do the things that we take for granted every day? He can't eat a pizza without help. He can't hold a fork and a knife to cut up that sirloin steak. He has to have somebody cut it for him. And it is for these veterans that we need to stand up for and take care of them. They stood up and defended our freedoms defended our way of life. And it is our turn to stand up and support them. At the VA hospitals, when I go there for my appointments, I stop in and talk to some of the veterans. There's a lot of them there that live there. They don't go anywhere. They starve for that human contact. They see their doctors and nurses on a regular basis. But they want somebody else to talk to whether it be about sports, the weather, or what we're going to do the next day. So it is for them that we need to stand up <coughs> and support and help them. Thank you. We'll now have a minute of silence. Contestant number five, Jerry Flowers. Just listen. Just listen, Jerry Flowers. Fellow Toastmasters, yes. Listen. Can you hear it? Be very quiet. Shh. Now, can you hear it? When you do, you'll recognize it immediately. After all, you've heard it many times before. It's your inner voice. Years ago, my daughter Stephanie, who was a senior level figure skater, got her toe pick caught in a crack in the ice during her program at a competition. She fell over backwards onto the hard ice, her head bouncing several times before she lay still on the ice. The audience gasped, expecting the worst. The seconds ticked by. Then, despite being in pain, she slowly picked herself up and finished her program to a standing ovation. Later, I asked her what had gotten her up off the ice, despite being in so much pain. She said, Dad, as I lay on the ice, a voice inside of me said that I was OK, and that I needed to get up and finish my program, that it was important to me and to my audience that I do this. And so I did. There's many definitions of what the inner voice is, but I believe that this is the most accurate. 
the rapid assimilation of our impressions of a situation that results in an action or a judgment so quickly we're not sure how it arrived. That result is sometimes called a gut feeling, an intuition, a hunch, a snap judgment. Sophie Burnham, the best-selling author of the book, The Art of Intu In Intuition, said, the number one thing that distinguishes intuitive people is that they listen to rather than ignore their inner voice. She goes on to say, I haven't met a successful business person yet who didn't say, I don't know why I did that. It was just a hunch. But that's not to say that we should just rely on our hunches at the expense of reason. Important decisions require a good dose of both. However, how many times have we heard the phrase analysis paralysis? We've all had the experience of using reason to overanalyze a problem to the point where we become paralyzed when it comes time to make a decision. Just relying on reason or just relying on intuition, both have their strengths and weaknesses. However, as Confucius said, the happy medium is best. Let me give you an example. Recently, I was approaching a green light. As I got closer to the intersection, a voice inside me said that I needed to slow down. But my rational mind gave me many reasons why I didn't need to slow down. It was a clear day. It was bright and sunny. It was dry. And I had the green light. Yet, I listened to my inner voice. And I slowed down. A moment later, a speeding car came out of nowhere and ran the red light. Had I ignored my inner voice and instead just gone with reason, I would have been in a terrible accident. In a world where we're inundated with facts, figures, and opinions, much of it from the internet or TV, it's not surprising that we can struggle in listening to our inner voice. Steve Jobs of Aquafane said, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your inner voice. Steve Jobs relied greatly on his inner voice, and much less on market research and focus groups to help guide him in developing Apple's innovative products. <coughs> but he wasn't alone. There had been others like it. For example, Henry Ford, the father of the automobile, said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. <laughs> we should never, never, never be afraid to listen to our inner voice. Not listening deprives ourselves of a powerful tool that helps to keep us moving forward, opening new doors, trying new things, and finding happiness. Great leaders such as George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Martin Luther King, whose birthdays we just celebrated, surely relied on their inner voices to help guide them during their uncertain and dangerous times. Times when they had no precedences to follow. Times when they had no how-to books to read. Times when they had no spreadsheets to analyze. Today, 
Stephanie doesn't have much time for figure skating. But she's never forgotten that fortuitous lesson she learned that day she lay still on the ice. She is a successful marketing manager for a leading e-commerce company and attributes much of her success to the fact that she listens to rather than ignores her inner voice. Contestant number six, Tom Keith. Wake up. Wake up, Tom Keith. I was hanging from a rocky cliff near a waterfall. The rocks were digging into my fingers and the palms of my hands. And the mist from the waterfall drenched my face and made my fingers slippery. I began to lose my grip and I knew that my only hope was to wake up. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, dreams like that are powerful. But dreams can be made so much more powerful when we take the lessons that they're trying to show us and we take action on that today. Our dreams can be vivid, enticing, intoxicating, and yet they're not real. Unlike visions, which are said to be glimpses of future events, dreams are manifestations of our subconscious minds as it's trying to process what's happening in our lives. Sometimes we don't understand what our dreams are trying to tell us. Three times in my life, I needed help understanding dreams. And the person who explained them to me also showed me how I could apply that knowledge to make powerful, important changes in my relationships, my health, and my career. The first time was about a year after Kim and I married. We were going through a rough patch. And so we decided to see a counselor named Shelley. At one session, I told that dream to Shelley about hanging from the rocky cliff. Shelley stopped writing, let her glasses slip down her nose, and then she said to me, Tom, dreams about letting go typically mean that the person feels uncertain in a difficult situation. Now you know what difficult situation you're in, right? <laughs> oh, wake up, Tom! It's your marriage. You feel that it's slipping away. That was it. Shelley explained to me that my dream was showing me that I needed to take decisive action because I might not have been in my dream marriage then, but with some effort, Kim and I could restore our relationship. About two years after that, I began to have a different dream, where I was standing near the edge of a steep, deep ravine. 
I could smell the moist vegetation, and I saw the long blades of green grass as my foot stepped on them, and I peered over the edge. Suddenly, the ground under my foot crumbled away, and I lost my balance, and I was afraid I was going to tumble down the ravine. After having that dream for several nights, I went to see Shelley to ask her what that dream was trying to tell me. <laughs> Song. Dreams about losing balance typically mean that the person feels unstable in their life, that they need to be more grounded. Now, you know what's going on in your life to make you unstable, right? <laughs> tells me you're not going to your AA meetings, is that right? Well, both Kim and Shelley were right. Even though I had been sober for several years at that point, I had become complacent and stopped going to my AA meetings. My dreams were telling me that I needed to take decisive action that day to get my dream program back in place. The final dream occurred about two years after that. I was standing on top of a skyscraper looking through an open window. I could hear the sounds of traffic and the wail of an approaching siren below. As I looked out the window, someone came up from behind and pushed me. I fell out the window and I was tumbling to the ground. I yelled out, no! But before I hit the ground, someone yelled out, wake up! <laughs> it was Kim who I had scared awake in the bed next to me. Now, Kim did not want that to become a recurring dream. <laughs> so the next morning, I took her sleepy, grumpy advice, and I went to see Shelly to ask her what that dream was trying to tell me. Tom, dreams about falling typically mean that the person feels pushed overboard, either physically or emotionally. Now, you know what's pushing you overboard, right? <laughs> oh, wake up, Tom! Tell me again about your job. Well, that was it. I had been telling Shelley that I had been working seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day, and my boss told me that I still wasn't working hard enough. My dream was showing me that I needed to take decisive action to get my dream job and put my career back on track. Three dreams over several years, all of them with the same solution. I needed to take decisive action that day to make important changes in my relationships, health, and career. And it's important to do it today because today is all we have. As the Indian Sanskrit poet wrote 1,500 years ago, look well to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is but a vision. But today, lived well, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well to this day. Fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, I invite you to examine your dreams and to take decisive action on the messages that they are trying to show you.
Mr. Conscious Toastmaster, we have all the ballots. Thank you to all the international speech contestants who participated. Let's give them one more loud round.
contestant, Steve Ackerman. Steve, <clears throat> how long have you been with Toastmasters? I joined Toastmasters in 1990. Wow. wow. Okay, very good. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you've probably earned an educational award too. <laughs> I'm a DTM and I'm working on my next. And the club that you're representing today, Deerbrook Park in Deerfield. And your uh, hobbies are tennis, reading, and writing. <coughs> Well, I think they all fit together in my own mind. You're reading and writing while you're playing tennis? Kevin is my doubles partner. You know, they, they say when you write something, your first draft should be with your heart and your second draft with your brain. And that kind of filters through the three things and how they fit together. And you're going to tell us a little bit about the uh, offices that you've held as a Toastmaster. Well, I really enjoyed being an area governor because you have an opportunity to go to so many different meetings and see the different cultures. We have clubs in this district that are uh, composed of only Filipino engineers. And I remember uh, a speech that I evaluated about vector angles with reinforced concrete. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, God bless the diversity down <laughs> Decisive action 
is the power that transforms ethereal dreams into tangible results. Explain that to us. Well, I just spent five to seven minutes doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it came from my speech, and the whole point being that we hear so much about dream it and you can do it. So much about dreaming, dreaming, dreaming. But the real changes in life come when we take those messages that our dreams are telling us and we take decisive action today to make those dreams a reality. Very good. Yeah. And I see that your interest is corporate social responsibility. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I think it's important for an individual and a company to give back to the community and to the people that have helped that person or that company along. In my current company, VW Credit, I am the chairman of our Corporate Social Responsibility Committee, so I get the pleasure of working with community organizations to get them some funding. We have an annual charity called Bobby, we raise about $25,000, and then we get to turn around and play Santa Claus and give that money away to worthy charities. And we try to find local ones, because we all know the big ones. But it's the individual small charities that really need those dollars. A thousand dollars to some of them can make such a difference. And so it's a pleasure being a part of it. Awesome. Thank you. Our sixth contestant, Natasha Jones. How long have you been with Toastmasters? Since October.
confirmed your CC. I have my CC and I'll have my CL by the end of this year. Very good. <laughs> Another person, interest in hobbies, writing. <laughs> Obviously, you talked about it. Yes. Um, are you working on a book? Let me tell you something that really freaked me out. This is a good table topic. <laughs> I started out a while ago thinking about how would the novel To Kill a Mockingbird progress if there ever was one written. So I sat down and I made an outline and started looking at it and assumed the character of Scout would age 25 years, take her to the 1950s. About a month ago, Harper Lee, the author, was quoted in the paper. They found a manuscript that she actually was a prequel. It was supposed to be a sequel to it, but it was written before. The same thing. She took the character and aged her 25 years in the future. <laughs> wow. right, it says, what inspires you, those that can create something from nothing. So tell me, who's created something from nothing that's inspired you? All of us here have gotten out, up on the stage and put a piece of their heart out everybody to be able to see that. Give everybody a new perspective on life. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Our second contestant, Pramod Singh. Pramod, how long have you been with Toastmasters? A little over two years. Okay, very good. And what club are you representing today? Look who is talking, Toastmasters. <laughs> for my speech today, I'll earn my advance uh, bronze. Oh, all right. As long as somebody evaluates you, yes, you can have credit for today's speech. <laughs> Your interests are sports, music, and reading. What sports are your favorite? All kinds of sports. Sport is really fun, and I love to go out and play uh, almost any kind of sport. I, I play, start from cricket to tennis to squash, badminton, you name it, ping pong. <laughs> Very good. I love this quote. Diamond is a piece of coal that worked well under pressure. <laughs> Explain to us why you like that quote. Uh, the first reason is because the place I belong to in India, that is full of coal. It's coal mine area. I know there are a lot of coal, uh, but uh, you know, I I rarely saw a diamond in my life. The one that I gave to my wife when I was engaged to her. But I knew that this any piece of coal is worthwhile only when I mean, if you if you prove yourself, and that too under adverse circumstances like the guy who competed against all odds. So that inspires me a lot. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Contestant number three, Eric Feinendagen. How long have you been with Toastmasters? Eleven years. <laughs> I'm going to save the suspense. I'm not a DTM. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of these days. Advanced Communicator Gold and Advanced Leader Silver. I just want to inform you that you can kick that can of a DTM sure, down sure. the road. Uh, I'm good at it, trust me. I just keep kicking it down. Okay. And here's your favorite quote then. Don't wait until it's too late. So tell us. <laughs> tell us. It's called a boy. I'm up to fire this guy. <laughs> well, in terms of the quote, um, so I'm in my 40s now, and you know, as as you age. Different things become important to you, and I have three small children. It, it's interesting because they're so, we're all so busy that we have choices that we make you know, throughout our daily lives. And just make time for the important things is what it comes down to. You know, don't, don't keep pushing off because 
you know, like my grand or my wife's grandmother will be 101 very soon. Um, no, she said it correctly. Today, live for today. You know, and Tom reiterated that. So that's what I'm trying to do. And forgive me, I believe I forgot to ask you what club you represent. Yes, Lake County Toastmasters. <laughs>
in a contest, what's the highest that you've achieved in, as an award? Well, I have been to district and I placed third in the humor speech contest a few years ago. Very good. Cool. Yeah, we're saving a tree, okay, people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have two options. Option one, we can all leave. <laughs> option number two, I'm going to invite Barbara up here, and we'll find out our winners. <laughs>
Dancing with the Stars? <laughs> <laughs>